Star Trek Lower Deck Season 4, Episode 3. Turn it off, turn it back on again, and move along home. Hey everyone, it is Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you right here from the heart of Trek land, letting the dust settle just a bit on all the new recent Star Trek headlines and episodes. And you know, so instead of a hot take or a quick take, you get a second opinion from Dr. Trek. Hey, I have been writing, editing, interviewing, witnessing, dot connecting, commenting, and well, okay, just witnessing Star Trek for quite a while now. And I just want to say, wow, <laughs> in the cradle of Vexalon, I guess Vexalon, it's vexing the same way Agimus is agitating? No, here we are on Corazonia. Did anybody else hear Corazonia? Horizonia? Corazonia. Yes, Corazonia. Kind of like an inverse Dyson sphere, only instead of it being a fully enclosed structure that's been built, at least one planet system around an existing star, this is the inverse. This is more like, you know, a ring world planet from Larry Niven's original known space stories. Only instead of it being an enclosed vessel, this is open top, but it's still circling around a star. Very cool. Is that an homage? It's interesting because, you know, Larry Niven's known space stories were the origin point of his Kazinti before they migrated over to Star Trek. So it's cool that we got the nod to tailor the Kazinti here. Uh, stick a pin in that one. I mean, there is so much to actually get in here just for a short Laura Dex. And not what you might imagine, but you know, kudos, kudos to Ben Waller, who was a writer's room assistant for season one through three, and he's now on the staff for season four. So yay, Ben, this is actually his second credit. He got trusted sources last year on his way up the ladder, and now here he is. So yay on that promotion, Ben. And then it's a celebration also for the director, Brandon Williams, who came to Lower Decks from Mortal Kombat Legends, from Little Demon, and Mike McMahon's other series, Solar Opposites. He's been and storyboard artisting <laughs> three times a year, all through the seasons. Congrats, though, on getting your first directing gig. And you know what? This may be one of the most intricate interweaving of the most characters that we've seen in a while on Lower Decks. It's a really good balance of using an awful lot of players, including the main players, and finding a way to balance all of that and get them down different kinds of paths and combinations. Okay, big things, little things. And I think it's cool that we've got not one, but two memes in one here to knock down, two old original series tropes. I mean, come on, raise your hand. If you thought Vexelon was going to turn all supercomputer evil planet ruling rogue like Landru or, or even Val and get one of those artisans to go carve his head out of a new piece of rock. I mean, the TOS trope of the evil supercomputer, right? It's been revisited already. We did have Agibus in season two's Where Pleasant Fountains Lie, right? Well, you got poked. And you know what? The whole science and craft of commercial computer repair got punk too. Yeah, the whole planet of Corazonia, or the ring, turns into the galaxy's biggest cubicle, and Freeman turns into their latest rep heading out from, um, from Nerd Herd. By the way, don't forget, Agimus is still out there somewhere going all buddy-buddy with his neighbor Peanut Hamper. Mmm, stay tuned. But what else do we get out of this sequence? Those Corazonians have been busy there not progressing, just enjoying their art and poetry for six million years? I mean, how long did Vexelon 1.0 sit there running just fine until the first update showed up? That in itself is six million years old. Overdue. And why? Because once again, it's original creators that we have no name for went all Organian or even Zalconian and transcended the fifth dimension. Talk about another original series trope. How many does that make now? Of course, meanwhile, the Corazonians had nothing to worry about for six plus million years, right? And of course, proving again, if you're not going to 
go all warp 10 and advance yourself into salamander state, you're just going to hit that plateau. You're just going to bump your head on the ceiling and do the whole art and poetry thing for millennia after millennia after millennia, I guess. Art and poetry, millions of years. Oh, and by the way, I love the one artist in the artist circle, right? When the crystalline clouds are crashing and the malfunctions, everyone else is in shock. Everyone else is running away. She's the one that just starts drawing the crash cloud. But boy, they sure don't build those mega structures like they used to, huh? Oh, and we've got an anomaly storage room on the ship, like it's no big deal, right? Apparently, that's this episode's version of, oh, I don't know, a Zabalian collector ship so we can Easter egg everything out the wazoo or a menagerarium or whatever you call it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nomad and the Catanan probe are there. Apparently, these are the study models that wind up eventually out at Daystrom Station in 20 years. What else is here, though? Looks like we've got a Batleth, a Betazoid gift box. Oh, yeah, and a Chula Wadi board. More on that in a minute, of course. Now, I'm convinced, after seeing how casual everybody is about the Anomaly Room, that this is exactly why we wind up with Daystrom Station. Sometime in the next 20 years, if every starship is carrying around, oh, a room full of just anything waiting to go wrong, that somewhere along the way there's a big accident, and that's why we wind up with everything in a central holding spot. This is insane. Oh, wait, it's Lower Decks. I mean, every Tom, Dick, and Harry starship can't have an anomaly room. It's like all that junk in your trunk you never take out. Oh, listen, I do love Dirk's soft spot. Tellarite jazz. <laughs> but in the words of that great philosopher, Joanne Worley, hey, is that another pig joke? I mean, bristle flarps, uh, scuzz blues, modal scuzz, flizz bop. Sizzle horn? It's all wet. And that's Bizintak. Yeah, who overdeed, who overdeed, <laughs> overdosed on Ketracel White during the great Ketroid epidemic, at least on Teller Prime. Hey, you wanted some Dominion War updates. What it is, is a lower decks slow burn for Tellerites. Sure, Mike McMahon says, we'll give you some Tellerite cannon one sliver at a time one sloppy sliver at a time all right i do have some questions this episode goes until 409 before we see any of the lower deckers is that some kind of a record i don't know someone with more time than me uh get on that please okay did those power units where boimler and his team were working did anybody else think they look like the warp core of the NX-01? Okay, the Billups Church Tower conversion hat and, and, and the skittery decapitating spider? <laughs> what? And what's with all the art attitude? Okay, I think it was hysterical that now we know Ransom is a secret art critic. That was hysterical. But does he know how many perfectly bored art and poetry societies are really out there? And then going further down this character's list, Boimler's team. Now, this is awesome. Look, we've seen Meredith, the Australian officer. We've seen her before, young ensign. Uh, this is her third appearance each time, voiced by actress Charlotte Nickdow. Uh, We've seen Taylor the Kazinti. We've been watching along. This isn't even the first time we've heard from Taylor. That's actually Fred Tatasior who's normally Shax, obviously. No, this is time, the cool thing is that we've got a big blue new guy who's literally called Big Merp. Not exactly clear about who's voicing Big Merp, but he's from that species, you know, that blue species. Now, apparently there's Little Merp. In fact, Little Merp has been seen several times through the show. He's more normal size. This is a big guy. Apparently why Boimler calls him Big Merp. The species, though, still hasn't been named. It's obviously a redrawing. We figured that's like There's one of those random aliens that was in the Star Trek VI in the Rurapinthe uh, prison. He was one of the prisoners. Never got a name, never got a species name, but he's sure all a part of, of Lower Decks. Several of the species are all over the ship in Lower Decks. 
Maybe one day we'll get a name, not this time. We'll be lucky if we figure out who the voice person is behind. Again, you task tease us, Michael, and we shall have it. Handy has another dose of, what, existential Orion angst here about her background that feels like it's building into something. It's becoming a regular beat at least once every episode. She says, on Orion, older pirates would have hazing of new recruits. I mean, if you're watching the preview reel for the season, there's an obvious Orion episode coming down the pike. I'm just saying. And amazingly, of all the regular characters, I love to Lynn here. Look, for everybody wondering how they were going to work to Lynn into the fabric, into the, into the uh, layout of the episodes when you've got the original quartet, and you've got all these other crew members who would be popping up occasionally. This is genius. It's actually, there's a moment where she's had moments with the rest of the Lower Deckers so far, most of them. And here, she actually takes charge. Boimler's starting to lose it. She's the one that, thank you to her Vulcan equanimity, she's the one that's kind of in charge. She's playing head counselor. So good on Talyn, but it's an example of how they're going to work her into the established flow of the series. It was a great moment, it made complete sense. It made Boimler a better person. And now I'm just waiting for her spotlight moment with Rutherford. She even has my favorite line of the episode. Everything that has ever occurred is science stuff. But most of all, Lieutenant Dirk. Really, really. Now hold on with me. This is gonna this is gonna take off. We've seen Dirk, but you go all the way back to the pilot episode, the opening minutes. It was Dirk who checked Tendi in when she first came aboard the Cerritos. He didn't have a name at the time, but that was Dirk. And it was still Phil Lamar as the voice actor among his many characters here. But most of all, Dirk gets his name here after a few appearances. But look, the question is, how old do you think Dirk is? I mean, what's the youngest he could be? Now, bear with me, bear with me. Now, I ask this because he says he was traumatized, locked in a chula room for a month when he was a kid. Okay. So Wadi first contact, that was first year of DS9, right? Move along home. Oh, yes. That was 2369, early in the first season. Now, I know you think it was just a great joke here to torture Rutherford and everybody else, just to chuckle you up. But if that was a true first contact in 2369, and it's now 2381, so we got 12 years later, okay, let's just say... Let's just say that Dirk was a quick or an early promoted kid, okay? Let's just say he's out of the academy at 22. He's an ensign. Let's say he makes JG at a year. He's 24, and he's now lieutenant. He's clearly a lieutenant at 25 at the earliest, okay? 25 minus 12. Was he 13 when he had this encounter with trauma in the Chula room? Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. It, it, I know he's, he's screwing with them. But it's got to make sense to the Lower Deckers. It's got to be halfway plausible. Was he 13 when this happened? Does that make sense? Do they really? Th now, the other end of this is, go back and look at Move Along Home. No, really, go back and look at it. We find out that that wasn't an accidental first contact with the Wadi. That was a formal ceremony. Remember? Check the tape. There was a Vulcan ship that encountered them three weeks prior to the episode. They were introduced to, to all things Federation at that time. They came from the Gamma Quadrant from that encounter. So there had been three weeks out there. My point is, was it not a big deal for a Wadi Chula room to get out early enough for it to start propagating out into the Federation? More than that, more than that, did it get out that humans had games too? Did the Vulcans pass that along? How did they know that? And how did they know when they came aboard that not only was there a huge collection of games on the station, humanoid federation bipedal games, but that they were all located in Quark's already? This wasn't any of Quark's doing. He was totally clueless. I'm, I'm sorry. I went down the move. I went down the Alamorain here. I'm getting a couple of chaps ahead of you, I guess. But this whole, this whole thing with Dirk's little trick 
got me thinking about the nature of the wadi and the chula in the first contact. Ala meringue count to three. Lemon meringue, same to me. Thank you. Thank you, Boimler. And thank you, Mariner. So yeah, this sounds like Dirk was ala meringued at 13. Unless that was all a lie, too. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. Well, what I do know is I still have two more questions. One of them, what happened to our little season-long arc killer guy or gal in this episode? You know, the little agonizer shape shift totally went away. And what about this idea that we're destroying ships, but we're not losing the crews aboard? Are they being beamed somewhere, transported somehow, taken prisoner, taken off? We just see the wreckage, not the people. And that would explain why our little wedge douche Klingon crew hasn't been wasted. But more important is the line, I miss my wife, going to be in every single episode the rest of the season? Or is this just an entire simulated life? And do I need to go take flute lessons? Okay, okay. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. This is a good place <laughs> to sign off on this second opinion. What do you think, though? What do you think about what I think? Hey, this is the place. This is the time. Please leave your comments below. I want to hear from you, okay? And while you're at it, hey, share, like, and subscribe. Can you do that? I dare you to subscribe for some sane Star Trek commentary. Most of all, if you appreciate the Dr. Trek point of view and our Trekland sensibility, I invite you to check out all of our live streams like Trekland Tuesdays Live and our podcasts like Trek Files from Roddenberry. And sure, even the rest of the channel, like Cadet Alice and Dr. Trek Talk Prodigy, more second opinions, all the live specials, all of it. And Portal 47, our live experiences, and Trekland Treks. Anytime you want to take your custom away mission around LA at a location site for Star Trek, all of it you can check out at LarryNimacek.com. Our T-Public store, too. <laughs> Trek well, everybody. <laughs>